Our text this morning will be Genesis chapter number 27. And while you're turning there, Genesis chapter 27, I'd like to say Happy Mother's Day to all of our mothers out there. This is a different kind of Mother's Day this year with all the craziness going on in our society. I'm sure a lot of you can't celebrate uh, like you normally do. Um, but you know, sometimes people do different things on Mother's Day. Back in 1971, the president of Central, the Central African Republic, his name was Bokasa, he celebrated Mother's Day by rounding up all the men who were in jail for committing crimes against women, and he brought them out and executed them. So that was a good way to celebrate Mother's Day, I guess. Um, and I'll read you these. These are some things that Mother taught me, not me necessarily personally, although some of them are true, but I thought this was good. My mother taught me to appreciate a job well done. She said, if you're going to kill each other, do it outside. I just finished cleaning. My mother taught me religion. You better pray that that will come out of the carpet. My mother taught me about time travel. If you don't straighten up, I'm going to knock you into the middle of next week. My mother taught me logic. Because I said so, that's why. My mother taught me foresight. Make sure you wear clean underwear in case you're in an accident. My mother taught me irony. Keep laughing and I'll give you something to cry about. <laughs> My mother taught me about the science of osmosis. Shut your mouth and eat your supper. <laughs> My mother taught me about contortionism. Will you look at the dirt on the back of your neck? That's hard to do. My mother taught me about stamina. You'll sit there till all the spinach is finished. Mother taught me about weather. She said, it looks like a tornado swept through your room. My mother taught me how to solve physics problems. If I yelled because I saw a meteor coming towards you, would you listen then? My mother taught me about hypocrisy. If I've told you once, I've told you a million times, don't exaggerate. My mother taught me the circle of life. I brought you into this world and I can take you out. My mother taught me about behavior modification. Stop acting like your father. That's a bad one. My mother taught me about envy. There are millions of less fortunate children in the world who don't have wonderful parents like you do. Now for a serious story, there was a man who stopped by a flower shop in order to have some flowers wired to his mother, which lived a couple of hundred miles away for Mother's Day. And as he was going into the flower shop, he saw this little girl sitting outside sobbing, and he asked her what the problem was, and she told him that she only had 75 cents to, to, her, to try to buy a rose for her mother for Mother's Day, and the roses were two dollars. He said, that's okay, sweetie, come in here. And they went in, and he just paid the money and got her a rose and gave it to her and went on his way. He had to take a few little uh, errands, do a few errands on his way home. And as he came back going home, he noticed uh, a graveyard that he passed as going to his house, and he saw that little girl out in the graveyard right beside a freshly dug grave, placing that rose on the grave. And so he turned around and went back to the flower shop. He canceled the order. He got some flowers and he got in the car and he drove in person to go deliver those to his mother. You know, we take things for granted oftentimes and many of us take our mothers for granted. And we thank God here at Calvary Baptist Church we have a lot of great mothers. I thank God for my mother. I am saved indirectly because my mother got saved. And of course, after she got saved, my dad got saved. And then my dad led me to Christ. So my testimony goes back to that. And so you make sure you remember your mother on Mother's Day and thank God for our good, godly mothers that we have. Our text will be Genesis chapter 27. We'll begin in verse number 1. I do want to preach a Mother's Day message. However, as I always try to do, I would like to get application for all of us. Everybody's not a mother, 
Uh, some of us, our mothers, might have already gone on to be with the Lord. Some of us, maybe um, just different situations. So I want to make sure we have application for all of us. But there's always some good themes that you can find along the lines of mothers. And we're thinking along these lines because it's Mother's Day. So I think this Bible scripture will be very pertinent to helping us, all of us, in our lives as Christians, not just mothers, but in particular as Christians trying to do God's will in mentoring others. Notice Genesis chapter 27. We'll begin in verse number 1. And it came to pass that when Isaac was old and his eyes were dim so that he could not see, he called Esau his eldest son and said unto him, My son, and he said unto him, Behold, here am I. And he said, Behold, now I am old, and I know not the day of my death. Now therefore take, I pray thee, thy weapons, thy quiver, and thy bow, and go out to the field, and take me some venison. And make me savory meat such as I love, and bring it to me, that I may eat, that my soul may bless thee before I die. Verse 5. And Rebekah heard when Isaac spake to Esau his son. And Esau went to the field to hunt for venison, and to bring it. And Rebekah spake unto Jacob her son, saying, Behold, I heard thy father speak unto Esau thy brother, saying, Bring me venison, and make me savory meat, that I may eat and bless thee before the Lord before my death. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice according to that which I command thee. Go now to the flock, and fetch me from thence two good kids of the goats, and I will make them savory meat for thy father such as he loveth. And thou shalt bring it to thy father, that he may eat, and that he may bless thee before his death. And Jacob said to Rebekah his mother, Behold, Esau my brother is an hairy man, and I am a smooth man. My father peradventure will fill me, and I shall seem to him as a deceiver, and I shall bring a curse upon me, and not a blessing. And his mother said unto him, Upon me be thy curse, my son. Only obey my voice, and go fetch me then. And he went and fetched, and brought them to his mother. And his mother made savory meat, such as his father loved. And Rebekah took goodly raiment of her eldest son Esau, which were with her in the house, and put them upon Jacob, her younger son. And she put the skins of the kids of the goats upon his hands and upon the smooth of his neck. And she gave the savory meat and the bread which she had prepared into the hand of her son Jacob. And he came unto his father and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, who art thou, my son? And Jacob said unto his father, I am Esau thy firstborn. I have done according as thou badest me. Arise, I pray thee, sit and eat of my venison, that my soul may bless me. And Isaac said unto his son, How is it that thou hast found it so quickly, my son? And he said, Because the Lord thy God brought it to me. And Isaac said unto Jacob, Come near, I pray thee, that I may fill thee, my son, whether thou be my very son Esau or not. And Jacob went near unto Isaac his father, and he felled him, and said, The voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he discerned him not, because his hands were hairy as his brother Esau's hands, so he blessed him. And he said, Art thou my son, very son Esau? And he said, I am. And he said, Bring it near me, and I will eat of my son's venison, that my soul may bless thee. And he brought it near to him, and he did eat, and he brought him wine, and he drink. We'll stop there for the sake of time. I'm sure most of you are familiar with this passage of Scripture. And I'd like to preach along the lines, of course, dealing with Rebecca as the manipulating mother. But as I said, I would like to maybe address this idea of manipulation in mentoring. All of us have three people that we surround ourselves with. We have someone that may be in front of us, encouraging us, bringing us along. They may be our parents. They may be an older friend. They may be a pastor. They may be a teacher. They may be some type of mentor. And they're in front of us, coaching us, bringing us along. We're watching them, learning from them. Then we have those that are beside us. They're just like us. They're kind of like our equals. It may be siblings. It may be co-workers or so forth or friends. And we're kind of all side by side doing the same thing. But then we have, or if you're a young child maybe, or you're an older sibling, uh, an older child, you may have someone, a younger sibling behind you. You have someone behind you watching you. And you are that mentor and that leader in that person's life. And as Christians, we are to set a Christian example and testimony. And one of the biggest things about being a Christian is the life that you live in front of others. 
the testimony and the Bible that you portray to those that you're trying to lead to a better knowledge of Jesus Christ. So I want to preach along those lines. I think it's good to use Mother's Day as a good example of this because how many times have we heard of the bridezillas when they go to get married and, you know, the bridezilla, everything's got to be her way or the highway. But what about the bridezilla's mothers? What about the proverbial mother-in-law jokes? And so the reason I say that is because we have this tendency in our society sometimes just to see that trait in mothers as far as trying to control and be overprotective and maybe even to the point of so controlling that they're manipulating. But I want us to use that and apply it to all of us. So I'm not just preaching to you mothers, although I am preaching to you, but I want to hopefully get application for all of us. Here in Genesis chapter 27, we have pages of the Bible roll back the private life of Isaac and his family. We see here in the text Isaac's will. He wants Esau to be blessed and have that blessing. We see Rebekah's ways, how she manipulates and goes and subverts the authority of her husband to get what she wants. And we also see Jacob's wiles, his tricks how he disregards Esau and Esau's interest for his very own interest. Everything here in the text is out of place. Rebekah is snooping around instead of trusting God. Isaac's cleaning his dentures and getting ready for this big meal. All he can think about is the venison. All he can think about is filling his belly. He's not praying about God's will. He's not praying about how to pass this blessing on. And then you have Jacob who get this, and you probably don't think about it, and I don't either, normally when I read it, Jacob is 70 years old or better. 70, 75, 77. And he's still having to take orders from his mama. So that shows you Jacob is definitely at fault. And there's everything's out of place. Now what about Isaac? Isaac was a great type of Christ back in Genesis 22. You know the story. God told Abraham, take your son, thine only son whom thou lovest, up into the land of Moriah and offer him for an offering. Of course, Abraham had Ishmael as his firstborn son, but God said that Isaac was his only son. That points in figure to Jesus Christ as the only begotten son of God. And he tells him, take your son up there and give him as an offering. And Abraham went up there, and when Isaac knew what was going on, he said, okay, Father, we have the wood, we have the fire, but where is the lamb? Genesis 22, 8, Abraham makes this statement. God will provide himself a lamb. Of course, that prefigures in type Jesus Christ, John 1, 29, as the lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. God himself will become that lamb. Of course, Isaac willingly obeys his father. He lets his father tie him up. Isaac is young and strong, and he could have resisted his father, but he let his father tie him up. He was subservient to his father's will. And you know the story. God stopped Abraham from killing his son, and what he wanted to do is see if Abraham loved God more than he loved Isaac. But Isaac is a great type picture of Christ. We know that further because Isaac marries Rebecca, and you have in Genesis chapter 24 a type of the Holy Spirit, the servant whose name later is given as Eliezer, or previously I should say. But Eliezer's name is not even given in Genesis chapter 24 because the servant never speaks of himself, never gives his name. He simply says, I am Abraham's servant, and he goes to Laban to find a bride for his master. That's a type of the Holy Spirit seeking out those to be in the body of Christ, to be the bride of Christ. Rebecca is a type of the bride of Christ, which would be the church, you and me. And so Isaac is a great type picture of Christ. Out of the patriarchs, he's the only one who only has one bride. He is not a polygamist like the other patriarchs. And of course, Jesus Christ has one chaste virgin presented to him, and that is the church, the bride of Christ. But he was a great type of Christ, but things have happened since Genesis 22 to where he has backslid, for the better sake of a term. And now all he can talk about and all he can think about is his stomach. You know, here he is, he says, it's the day of my death. He's around the same age that Ishmael, when he, when he, would, when he died, about 137. By the way, Isaac lives to be about 180 
But he says, I'm about to die, so I need to go ahead and get this blessing. I need to get my house in order. And, and he starts talking about this venison. As a matter of fact, in the text, you'll notice he mentions savory meat six times, venison seven times, and he goes on and on about eating and having this food. And the Bible tells us back in Genesis uh, chapter 25 that Isaac loved Esau because he did eat of his venison. <laughs> and Rebecca loved Jacob. What a reason to love your son because you eat of his venison. That's the one thing that stood out. Maybe Isaac wasn't as manly a man as he wanted to be, but he was proud of his son that was the hunter that was kind of like Nimrod back in Genesis 10. There's this hunter and this archer, and he's this outdoorsman. And, or maybe he always looked up to his older brother Ishmael. I don't know the background behind, of all, behind all of this, but he loved his son, and his son, the Bible tells us, was profane. Go back. We don't have time to look at the scriptures. Over in Hebrews, the Bible calls him profane. Esau was a wicked man. He was a fornicator, the Bible tells us. But that didn't bother Isaac. He still wanted to give the blessing to Esau. He overlooked the fact that Esau was not spiritual at all. Why is that? Because Isaac wasn't spiritual. Isaac had backslid. Let me tell you something. You're never going to be the leader or the mentor that you're supposed to be if you're not spiritually minded. If everything's about the flesh, if everything's about success, if everything's about money, if everything's about all the things of this world, that is going to transfer over to your kids and to those that are looking up to you. They will see the glimmer in your eye toward the things of this world. Now, if they see in your eye that you like to read the Bible, or they see in your voice that you tremble before God, or they see in your knees that they get down on your knees, and you put God first, and you put the Bible first, and you tell other people about Jesus, that'll have a big impact. But boy, look at Isaac. He's about as spiritual as... Any of the Canaanites in the land of that day. He just turned a blind eye to Esau's carnality and worldliness. And he purposely was going against what God had already revealed. Turn back to Genesis 25. Genesis chapter 25. And notice here in Genesis chapter 25 when Rebekah is struggling in childbirth. Verse number 22. Well, this is before she has, has the children. Verse 22, the children struggled within her, and she said, If it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord. Verse 23, and the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. And the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. We know that Jacob gets the, steals the birthright from Esau previously back in Chapter number 25 as well. But here we have Isaac with revelation already given. Surely Rebekah told Isaac about that. And God may have already given other revelation to Isaac about this blessing. But he is going to do what he wants to do. He's the man of the house. He wants the venison. He wants Esau, the firstborn, to have the blessing. He doesn't think Rebecca's dream or her vision or whatever, however God spoke to her back in Genesis 25 is authoritative at all. Now here in Genesis 27, you notice some things about Isaac. You notice his sight failed him. He was blind, the Bible tells us. You'll notice his smell deceived him. He smelled that clothes that Jacob was wearing and he just assumed that that was Esau. Esau always stunk. I don't know if he always ate garlic or he never took a bath or what it was, but the man stunk. His taste failed him. He's sitting there eating savory goat meat, and he thinks it's venison. I haven't had goat's meat. I've had lamb before. Lamb chops are delicious, but I've never taken goat's meat and tried to compare it to venison meat. I know I've had venison um, uh, uh, steaks before, venison... Uh, hamburger steak, and it'd be really better than uh, beef hamburger steak, but you really couldn't tell the difference. I couldn't have told you that was venison hamburger steak. But his smell deceived him. 
His sight failed him. His taste failed him, rather. His smell deceived him. His taste failed him. His feelings failed him. He felt that hair on Jacob's hand and it deceived him. Now here's the thing. His hearing rang true. He kept saying, is this Jacob's voice? You'll notice in verse number 21, Come near that I may feel thee. Verse number 22, The voice is Jacob's voice. He didn't trust what he heard. You know, the Bible says faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. You better trust what you hear from the Bible and what you read from the Bible instead of just these other senses because you can be manipulated. Isaac was to pass on this blessing. Now, what did the blessing entail? The Bible tells us some things about the blessing. It had to do with family property. It had also to do before the Levitical priesthood the family priesthood. The father, the leader of the house, was what you would call the priest of the house. And it also had to do with family pedigree. The right to be in the line, the messianic line of Jesus Christ, would come through this blessing. We know that from Genesis chapter 3, verse number 15. And we also know that from Genesis chapter 15 and chapter 17, the blessing that God gives to Abraham. And that seed, as you read in Genesis, as you trace that thing down, is being attacked over and over and over. The devil tries to thwart the promises of God to send a Messiah the seed of the woman. So we have this blessing that is to be given by Isaac, and then we have Rebekah come along. Now Rebekah, it's sad that she never knew her mother-in-law Sarah, because Sarah learned to call Abraham Lord, little L, but she learned obedience, and she learned to trust God and to pray for God to change her husband instead of trying to change her husband herself. Rebekah was probably a very strong-willed woman, but she never learned to submit to her husband. Instead, she was going to manipulate circumstances to put her son, Jacob, her favorite, in the position that she wanted. Instead of trusting God to do what God said He's going to do, she's plotting and she's planning to mentor and to put things in place so everything turns out according to her schemes. Now, look in 1 Timothy chapter 2 real quick. This will probably be the only place we turn. I want to show you this regarding motherhood. 1 Timothy chapter number 2. And here in the passage, Paul is dealing with, obviously, the church and with Christians in general and with the home life. You'll notice that he deals with, with women and their apparel and how they dress modestly in verse number 9. Verse number 10, "...but which becometh women professing godliness with good works." 1 Timothy 2 verse 11. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach. Go tell that to the modern churches now that all it is is women preachers and teachers. You say, well, they're not preaching. Yeah, but they're, they're standing behind pulpits teaching 500 women. What do you call that? Well, you know, women need to hear from women. No, we've gotten into an effeminate age where women want their emotions tickled. The Bible called men to preach. The Bible called men to be the disciples, men to be the apostles, not women. The problem is we don't have women being mothers like they're supposed to be. We have women trying to be fathers. Let me go ahead and say this to you fathers. Some of you fathers aren't being the fathers you need to be. Therefore, the mothers are having to get out of their roles. Everything's all mixed up just like it was here in Genesis 27. Back to the text here, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2. And the churches are messed up. I thank God that we've got a lot of men in our church. I know that there are a lot of churches, a lot of Baptist churches, if you go in and you took a survey, you would find the majority are women. Now, I'm not saying anything against women, but that's sad. That shows me a couple of things. It shows me who's behind the pulpit. If you listen to some of these whatever you call them, preach. These men get up there and preach. These supposed preachers, it's no wonder no men want to come in there and listen to them. Because they don't talk like a man. They don't act like a man. They want to get up and just, and just uh, uh, share and cope and, and not offend anybody and, and be nice to everybody. And It's some type of effeminate Christianity going on. But I thank God we've got some real men. But here's the problem. You have men that won't be the fathers they need to be, so the mothers are pulled out of their role. 
There has to be structure and order in the home or things will not grow and progress like they are supposed to. God gives order for a reason. Come back to 1 Timothy 2. I'm trying to get through this. 1 Timothy 2.11 Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection, but I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Why? What's the reason? Here's the reason. It has nothing to do with Adam sinning. Notice the reason, verse 13. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. There are two reasons given. Verse 13, Adam's first. There's an order, there's a structure. 1 Corinthians gives us the order. It's God, it's Christ, it's the man, it's the woman, and then the child. There's not, it's not saying that the woman is less than the man. It's just saying that she is under the man. You take a porcelain dish, a porcelain dish isn't any uh, less value than an uh, iron skillet. They're just different. Some of you men, you're rusty old iron skillets. And some of you delicate porcelain dishes, you're not an iron skillet. You're not supposed to be. God made people different for a reason, and He made men and women different for a reason. Celebrate diversity! You're supposed to be different. God made you a certain way, and you need to flourish in the way God made you. Now, here's the second reason. Adam wasn't deceived. The woman is made to be ruled from her heart, not from her head. And the devil got into her into a match of wits, and he began to battle that, and he got her to move her out of her realm, and he began to trick her and to deceive her, and she really thought that what she was doing was good. When women get into trouble, they generally are convinced that what they're doing is right. Men will do what's wrong knowing it's wrong. When Adam took that fruit, he knew it was wrong, but he did it because he loved Eve, and he took the blame. And as the federal head of the race, it goes back on Adam. Verse 14, Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Notice the context is authority, verse 12. Verse 15, notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing. It's not saying she'll be saved from hell like Romans 10, 13. The word saved has to be with being rescued or being delivered from what? What's the context? The context has to do with authority. In verse 14, being deceived, she was overstepping her bounds in authority by talking to the devil without Adam there. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity with holiness and sobriety. So this idea of her having children underneath her and her being in a position of leadership and having to have authority over that child, if her and her husband do things right and they have the right structure, she will not be deceived in what she's doing in raising those children. Now Rebecca is out of line here. And now she's trying to manipulate things her way. Now what about Jacob? Jacob, it didn't bother Jacob. Come back to Genesis 27. It didn't bother Jacob in verse number 12. It didn't bother Jacob that he was a deceiver. What bothered Jacob is he didn't want to seem as a deceiver. You see that in verse number 12? I shall seem to him as a deceiver. You see, Jacob had deceived himself long before he started tricking and manipulating people. He had lied to himself a long time before, and he had already gotten the birthright, and now he's just going to step over Esau. Esau is just collateral damage. Whatever he's got to do to get what he wants, he's already lied to himself. We know that when he finally does wrestle with the angel of the Lord, the angel asks him, what is your name? And he can't say Esau then. He has to say Jacob, which means supplanter, deceiver, trickster. He's got to own up to it. Jacob tells four lies in a single breath in verse 19. He says, I am thy firstborn. Lie. Well, he says, I am Esau. Lie. I am Esau thy firstborn. Lie number two. I have done according to thou bates me. That's a lie. Because he didn't tell him to do it anyway. And he didn't do it. Then he says, Arise, I pray thee, eat of my venison. Venison. It's not venison. It's goat's meat. Four lies in one breath. Then he goes on when he says, are you, and he asked him, how did you get it so quickly? Fifth lie, verse number 20, the Lord God brought it to me. Boy, he's pious, isn't he? Now, let's just look at a few things here and we'll be done. The basis of this behavior, I believe, when I talk about this behavior, I'm talking about manipulation in mentorship. Are you a manipulator or are you a mentor? Are you a bully 
Or are you a blessing? Are you trying to lead someone properly or are you trying to manipulate and guide and work the circumstances for your advantage? The basis of this behavior is selfishness, I believe. Isaac and Rebekah both have their favorites. I gave you the verse earlier, Genesis 25, 28. The Bible says Isaac loved Esau because he ate, did eat of his venison, but Rebekah loved Jacob. They had their favorites for whatever reason, and they were selfish in that. You'll notice also that Jacob want what he wanted what he wanted regardless of Esau's rights, regardless of what God had to say about it. If God had already set things up, and God had already promised the blessing to go to Jacob, the Lord was going to work that out. That does not justify this foolishness and these sins that we see in this passage. Selfishness will motivate you to manipulate things to work out according to you want, how you want them. I think number two, pride is evident. Pride is real similar to selfishness. Here we have Isaac going against God. Isaac's will is more important than God's will. He's gotten so far from God, he couldn't hear the God's voice if he wanted to. He is so stuck on what he wants for his firstborn. Then you have Rebecca going against her husband. Somebody said, a truly strong woman will use her strength to minister strength to her husband, not to rob him of whatever backbone he might once have had. Some of you ladies that have strong personalities and strong wills, you need to watch this. You need to be behind and supportive of your husband. Take that energy and turn it into prayer for the leader in your life. Pride. We think we know best. And then as we deal with this behavior as it touches others, I know there's a fine line here, especially when you're dealing with parenting. There's a fine line when you have a teenager, and let's say the teenager breaks something at the house. And obviously it was an accident, but it's going to cost some money to have it repaired. And do you go ahead and get mad, sure enough mad, and punish them and make them go out and earn it and pay it? Or is that your own selfishness and pride riling up? If it was your friend that was over at your house and they tripped and fell and broke it or whatever the thing was, would you say, well, you know, I don't, you know, I just, hey, I can, I can take a loss. Or do you have to get to a place to where you see that as an opportunity to teach that young person a lesson about responsibility? I'm sure there's a fine line as we try to mentor those underneath us. There's a fine line in taking every chance you can to run them down and point out their faults. Our mentors will point out our faults. They will use liberties from time to time to say, hey, have you considered you're doing this wrong? Have you considered you're not looking at this thing right? But if our mentors always pointed out every place we failed, that is going to put a failed image and perception of ourselves in our own mind. You have a kid and you're always telling them they're stupid. You're always talking down to them and using verbiage like you're dumb or, you know, you're stupid or you just messed up. Can't you do anything right? If you're always using that type of language, you are damaging that child. Let me say this about stewardship. We are entrusted as stewards with our children. We are entrusted as pastors with our congregations. We are entrusted as Sunday school teachers with those that we teach. We are entrusted as Christians with those that are looking up to us for spiritual guidance. They're watching us to see how we respond, how we live out our Christian life. We have responsibility. And this idea of abasing others and putting others down just because we can. It's kind of a case system, if you will. And look, I know there's structure. I know God has set up authority in our land and in our society and in our homes. But those authorities, as we're seeing in our current society, in this craziness that we're in, you see abuse of authority everywhere. Somebody said absolute power will, corru will uh, corrupt absolutely. And I believe we as mothers and as fathers and as preachers and pastors and, and mentors, coaches, teachers, 
whatever role, neighbors, co-workers, and you're uh, trying to bring someone along spiritually, you're praying for them and helping them. We have to examine our hearts to see if we are manipulating, controlling, or if we're mentoring. I think sometimes we love ourselves more than we think. Could it be that we're really trying to help ourselves instead of trying to help those underneath us? Could it be that we're really trying to live out our own lives and the lives of those that we are training along? Could it be that we failed so much we're trying to make sure they don't fall so we can somehow justify ourselves and redeem ourselves? Some of you parents, maybe you got saved late in life and now you're just pushing your kids and pushing your kids. Let me say this as, as a preacher. I'm not a, trying to give you parenting advice. Believe me, I'm not. Please don't use the Bible as a bullying stick. Don't use church as a bullying stick. Don't give a presentation of God. Go in your room and pray about it. And take and read 15 chapters out of your Bible. Memorize all these things. You are creating rebellion. Because all they can do is associate punishment with the Bible and with God. Does God chasten us? Yes. They will understand that authoritative figure in their life, especially a father figure as God. The closest thing we have to show us what a father is, and Jesus uses this illustration in the prodigal story, the prodigal son story in Luke 15. Our fathers are the type picture of God in our life. And yes, when we do wrong, they chasten us, but not for out of just their own pleasure, as Hebrews tells us, but God chastens us for his profit, for our profit for our good and for His glory. And so you want to make sure that you're not just trying to live out your life. That's pride. That's abuse. Abasing others because they're underneath you. Just because you're the boss, you've got to tell them what to do and you're taking a break and you're not letting them take a break. Just because you're in a position of authority, you think you can manipulate and you can just run things. And as long as they do like you say do, everything's fine. No, everything's not fine. They may be doing it on the outside, but on the inside they're not. Kind of like the little kid. You know, they get on to him and get on to him at supper. And finally they tell him, go over there and stand in the corner. And he goes over there and stands in the corner. He goes, I'll stand in the corner, but I'm sitting down on the inside. You may think everything's fine just because you got the cookie cutter thing all in a row, but that doesn't mean that person as an individual hasn't turned their heart in another direction. Here's some of the processes behind this behavior. I believe they think the end justifies the means. Rebecca and Jacob, obviously, they think lying and deceiving is not so bad because, after all, didn't God say the elder would serve the younger? The end justifies the means. I've got to make things look right. I've got to have my family in order if it means I've got to yell and scream, if it means I've got to do... If you're having to verify the fact that you're wearing the pants, you're not wearing the pants. If you're having to tell everybody you're the boss, you're not the boss. Being in a position of leadership gives you an opportunity to lead. Just having the title doesn't make you that person. Well, you know, I'm a father. No, you might be a biological father, but you might not be a true father. Well, I'm their mother. Okay, you might be biological, but are you mothering? Are you fathering? Are you parenting? Are you leading as a preacher? Well, I'm the pastor, so I can say this and I can say that. Are you leading by example? The end justifies the means. It's all about pride. It's all about selfishness. Isaac, it's all about his firstborn. He's got to see Esau succeed. His flesh is more important than spirituality. And when you study this behavior, you see that people are often mistaken that they can control the circumstances and the outcome of others. Concerning Esau, really, when you think about it, he was profane. Spirituality can't be passed on from father to son. I know the idea of gener generational blessing and cursing, we see some of that in the Old Testament. But you have to be real careful when you try to apply that in a New Testament setting. And some of you parents, you have to be real careful because you have to realize those kids are individuals. 
Some of you, as you preach and you teach, maybe you have somebody that is a, a Christian, you're trying to guide them spiritually. You've got to understand they have got to develop a relationship with the Lord, not with you. It's good to have fellowship. Thank God for it. I'm glad that some of you like to come to church, and I'm glad that you like to study the Bible here, and I'm glad that I have the opportunity to hopefully teach you some things and be a pastor and give you some biblical counsel from the Scriptures, but I'm not here. Don't take this wrong. I am not here to develop a relationship with you. I am here so you can develop a relationship with the Lord. Yes, we develop a relationship with each other. 1 John chapter 1, if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. If we're going along the same road, we're going to have fellowship. But at the end of the day, as I try to mentor you, if I'm not here, you should still be able to walk with God. This idea that the whole church is going to come crumbling down because we can't assemble like we've always assembled... Is, that, is your fellowship with Jesus Christ that shallow to where you're going to backslide as soon as you can't walk through the doors? Your fellowship should extend beyond the walls of the church. And your fellowship should extend beyond the spirituality of your mentor or of your parent. You know, back in the Old Testament, you had uh, Joash. I get Joash and Josiah mixed up. I think it's Joash who I'm thinking of. Joash reigned when he was seven years old. And Jehoiada the priest instructed Joash, and he had instructed him into the ways of the Lord. And as long as Jehoiada was alive, Joash did fine. But as soon as Jehoiada died off, Joash consorted with the princes that were his peers, and he forsook God, and he went with the false gods. He even had Jehoiada's son murdered. As long as Jehoiada held the reins, as all long as he bullied him, if you will, and kept him in line, he did fine. But as soon as he was gone, that shows you Joash never had true faith in and of himself to begin with. So there's a false perception that we can control the outcome of others. Now what are the results of this behavior? And I'll be finished. You'll see in Jacob's story, there's lie upon lie. When you manipulate circumstances and you try to control others, you will find yourself in deeper and deeper. You'll notice with Rebecca, after this whole thing goes on, you know what happens. Come down to 41, 42, 43. Esau says, when he finds out, okay, my father's about to die, but as soon as he dies, I'm going to kill Jacob. He's taken my birthright. Now he's stolen the blessing. I'm going to kill him. Rebecca hears about it, and now she's got to control everything again. She digs herself deeper, and she says, Look, we've got to fix this thing. And she tells Isaac, Look, we need to send Jacob to find him a daughter back, back over there in Syria, where my family's from. He doesn't need to marry any of these wicked women here. And she begins to manipulate things. You'll notice in verse number 44, she tells her son, Tarry with him a few days until thy brother's fury turn, from, turn away. Terry, just go to Laban, my brother, for a few days. A few days turns into 20 years or better. And Rebecca dies before Jacob ever gets to see her again. She never sees her son again. You lose what you have. When you think you're trying to hold on to it so much, and you're holding on to that thing, and you're, you're, you're trying to control it so much, you better be careful. You better realize we are to live by faith and God's the one in charge and people have their individual wills. Some will, some won't. Some wait. So what? Jacob takes up a life of running. He runs and he runs into Laban. Then he runs from Laban and he runs into Esau. But before that, you know what happens? Right before he meets Esau, when he's running, he starts praying again. He tells his wives to put away their false gods. He says, we got to get back to Bethel. we got to get back to God. And he runs into the angel of the Lord that night at the Ford Jabbok. And he wrestles with the angel of God. That's when he comes face to face with himself. Before you ever face God, you've got to face yourself. And you've got to admit that you've been trying to manipulate things. You've been trying to control people. And you've got to admit what you are. And God touches him. And when God helps you and God straightens you out like he straightened Jacob out, he'll make you where you never walk the same again. Jacob limped away from there and he was a changed man. Now in conclusion, I want to say a couple things here.
Let me say this to those of you that are being mentored, maybe young people or kids. Give your parents and your mentors a little slack. They're people just like you. They make mistakes. They're trying the best they can. They're praying for you. They're trying to say things. And if they're a little hard on you, why don't you just thank God that at least they're not coming home drunk. At least they're not smoking pot on the weekend. At least they're not running off with some other woman and maybe you're in a split, divorced home. At least they're taking you to church. At least they're trying to read the Bible with you. So give them a little slack. They're hard on you because they love you. So let me say that. Let me say this too. The idea is not for you just to mimic and to follow and try to be like them. The idea is for you to eventually, Paul said you became followers of us, 1 Thessalonians 1, you became followers of us and of the Lord. The idea is for you to begin your relationship with Jesus Christ. You read the Bible on your own. You decide that you want to start coming to church. You decide that you want to tell people about Jesus. You decide that you have some convictions and certain things you're not going to do now because you're a Christian. You begin to follow the Lord. Personal responsibility. Now let me say this to you mentor, mentees or parents, grandparents. Some of you are just too controlling. You're just too domineering. You're too dictating. You've got to learn to let go. You're just trying to be like Rebecca. You're trying to be like Isaac. Just trying to do what you want to do, especially like Rebecca, trying to manipulate all these little circumstances. Well, you know, he's going to go here and, and I'm going to have him go there because he can meet this person and she can meet this person and this is the person they're going to marry and this is how this is going to work out. Look, I know as a parent you have to set boundaries, you have to set rules and so forth, but you have to be real careful. If you are a controlling type of person, those parents are not, I mean those kids are not yours. So how dare you tell me that? I just told you that. Your kids are gods. You have a responsibility to raise them. We do baby dedications here all the time. And in the baby dedication, we pray. And basically what we say in the baby dedication, the parents are publicly presenting their child in front of God and the church and saying, we as stewards are going to do our best to raise these children as God's children. Too controlling. Are you a bully or are you a blessing? The Bible does tell us in Deuteronomy 6 verse 7, Thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children and shalt talk of them. Talking about the scriptures. Yes. The Bible does say, train up a child the way he should go, and when he's old he will not depart from it. Proverbs 22 6. The Bible does say, Ephesians 6 4, Ye fathers, Provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Don't forget the first part of the verse because of the second part. Nurture, admonition. Don't provoke them. Break their will, but not their spirit. And some of you, you're guilt-ridden because maybe those you've tried to mentor, those you've tried to lead, maybe you've had some folks you've tried to invite to church, you tried to lead them along, but they're not following the Lord anymore. You're blaming yourself. Well, if you did all you can do, forget about it. Some of you have parents that have gone astray. If you keep blaming yourself, you're going to have to blame God because God had Adam and Eve there, and in the garden, they messed up. You're going to blame God for that? Do your best. Present them to God. They have to make that choice. So for Mother's Day, I hope maybe we've gotten some help from this. Mentoring instead of manipulation. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the text. Thank you for these lessons. Help us to apply these things in our lives to be the best Christian examples we can be. Thank you for those you put in our lives. Thank you for our mothers in our lives that have guided us in spiritual paths. And God, thank you for those you've placed in our life to lead us in the ways of righteousness. Help us to think about these things and to apply them as we Think about those that are behind us, that we could do a good job for you as a steward entrusted with mentoring. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.